right, good morning. Whoo, has it been a morning? Um, in fact, if y'all don't mind, I'm going to take about a 10-minute nap over here, and then we'll get started. How's that, yeah? No, I'm kidding, but um, we, uh, we got here this morning and found out lightning had done some damage to some of our sound system, and nothing was working properly, and thanks to Chris and Gordon and their ingenuity, they managed to pull enough wires out and switch enough wires around that we've got enough of it working to actually have our worship service today. So praise the Lord for that. That's a good thing. And uh, we'll be calling. The, it's actually just a really simple one little box that's out, but that's okay. We it, That one little box controls everything. Just Isn't that nice to have that? So um, we'll be able to get that fixed, Lord willing, this week, and no problems there. All right. So um, I am literally out of breath. <laughs> Which is always fun because I have been running this morning trying to. We were going to set up a partial sound system and and then or a, a portable sound system and then they got it going and so anyway, all right. Uh, if this is your first time with us this this morning, we want to welcome you and let you know that you are an answer to our prayers. Uh, we have been praying for you uh, to be here. We have uh, we are always uh, interested in seeing our our church family grow, and we we are so glad that you are with us. And if this if you it's your first time, or if you have never taken the time to fill out one of the the guest information. Uh, things you can do that in a couple of different ways there should be one in the pew back card in front of you there's one a card there also inside the bulletin there's a, a qr code you can scan with your phone that will take you to our website where you can fill out the guest registry online and or you can go to the connect desk after the service and fill out a form there and uh, if you have never been by the connect desk as as our guest we encourage you to do that we have a gift a gift for you back there to thank you for being with us today as uh, being with our, our our family, and we want to uh, encourage you to, to keep on coming because it is a blessing that you are here and you are most certainly an answer to our prayers. Uh, this afternoon, we have the membership luncheon. Uh, that's right after church, and that is uh, the membership class. That is uh, an, uh, two hours or an hour and a half? Two hour, two hour class uh, that gives you basically everything you need to know about what it means to be a member at Center Fork. So if you're interested in membership here, um, then that's that's the class you need to attend. We also have the Connect Luncheon that um, is just a chance if this is you know you're wanting to get to know staff and all of that. That is coming up the uh, f the 26th of June. Yes, so the the and so that gives you a chance to meet the staff, find out just some general information about the church, and uh, and so if you'd be interested in that, that's June 26, and those rotate every couple of weeks so that um, you get a chance to do that. Uh, to, uh, tomorrow night, 6 p.m. for our prime timers, that's our 55 plus age group. Um, and a few others that sneak in here and there. Uh, tomorrow night at 6 p.m., if you plan to come and have not signed up or told Judy uh, you're coming, please sign the sign-up sheet in the foyer or let Judy know or both uh, so that they can be make sure that they've got enough food there for everybody. So prime timers are meeting tomorrow night at 6 p.m., so make sure Judy knows you're coming or you, know, you may have to sit there and watch everybody eat. So not, not really, but anyway. All right, um, let's see. Is there any other announcements that I'm missing? Anybody knows of Tanya VBS? Okay, yes, Tanya is, has the uh, Vacation Bible School. Can you believe it is almost here? And so she has packets that um, will be d down here in the front. Yeah, so if you'll meet right after church, right down here, she'll give you your VBS packets and uh, the information that you need for that if you're helping out in VBS. Or if you're interested in helping out in VBS, trust me, she'll put you to work. So uh, there's plenty to do. All right, let's, uh, we'll get things started with Micah chapter 7. Uh, verses 5 through 8, it says, Do not trust in a companion. Do not rely on a friend. From her who lies in your embrace, guard the doors of your mouth. For the son dishonors the father. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The enemies of a man are the members of his own household. But as for me, I watch for the Lord. I await the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. Although I have fallen, I will arise. Although I dwell in darkness, the Lord is my light. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the chance to come together and to worship you. And Lord, I just pray that everything we do this morning would be glorifying to you, that we would honor you in it all, and that your name would be lifted up in praise and worship and glory, and that we would uh, be brought closer to you as a result of being here today. Lord, if there's anyone here who does not know you as Savior, I pray that uh, today would be the day that they would make the decision 
uh, to turn away from sin, turn towards Jesus, and accept you as their personal Savior and Lord, and begin an eternal life with you uh, as this blessing, blessing that you give us in, in that wonderful faith. And Lord, we just uh, ask your blessings on this service now. Help us glorify you through it all, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand together, get everybody in place, and uh, pray everything works. Everything that we've got working works. Yes? I love this arrangement. If you've not heard it, most of you have. Um, I did this my very first Sunday here when I came in view of a call. It's heavenly sunlight, but it's kind of got the old 50s style uh, chords progressions to it. And uh, it's just a, just a nice arrangement of heavenly sunlight. Here we go. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountain through the deep end. Jesus has said, I never forsake me. Promise in my life, never can fail. Chris is up there going, I can't get his guitar to come through, so, but anyway. All right, isn't that fun, though? Heavenly sunlight. We get to walk in the sunlight of God's love. What a beautiful, wonderful blessing. Even when the storms are raging, we get to, to live in the light of God's love. And he is this wonderful, wonderful Savior, and he is Jesus our Lord. And you know, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. You remember that old hymn? And he covers me there with his hand and, I, and we're going to sing that this morning he hideth my soul a wonderful savior a wonderful savior is jesus my lord a wonderful savior to me he hideth my soul in the Good job. 
such m amazing compassion, such amazing grace, such amazing love for us. How could it? I, I, don't, I never understand how, and I know not everybody sings, okay, I get that, but being the, in the musical family that I am, I, I, I never have been able to understand how someone could stand in the presence of God in his service and not sing. I, I mean, I, I get it. Not everybody sings, but, I, you know, it's like, how can you not? You know, but then that's what I do. So, you know, I get it. But, but how can I keep from singing his praise? Such a beautiful song, and let's sing it together. sound 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. getting that to work. We, this has been one of those days. <laughs> but Allison brought this song to me, and she's like, I want you to sing this with me. And I said, okay, we can do that. And it took us a while to be able to get to having enough time to practice it. And it's, it's a beautiful song. It's uh, one that you've probably never heard. It's called His Eyes on the Sparrow. Anybody ever heard that one? Uh, 
And I love, I'm kidding, by the way. I know every, just about everybody's heard that. Some of you may have never heard the song, His Eyes on the Sparrow. And if you haven't, um, oh, what a blessing it is. And it is uh, just the thought to me that the God who has the power to just speak and absolutely nothing becomes absolutely everything. Ha that same God takes the time to literally, the Bible says, find out and know each individual sparrow. And sparrows, if you don't know, are basically like the vermins of the, <laughs> you know, they're, they're of, of the uh, bird kingdom. They're, they're just, there's a million of them, and they're everywhere, and nobody really cares about them. There's not that much value to a sparrow but there is in the eyes of God. And I got news for you. In the eyes of God, we are not much more than vermin ourselves, the way we were born. But once Jesus comes and, and you put your faith and trust in him and you are washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ, then you become something that is of infinite value to God because the blood of Jesus Christ, which, has be, which is beyond value, beyond price, has been applied to your life. And that God loved us enough to give his life for us so we could have eternal life with him. Are we good? So I love to know his eye is on the spirit. Does my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend. Oh, and I 
Sean and Allison for that. And he does watch us, doesn't he? I left after frantically trying to help these guys get the sound system working. I just said, you know what, Lord? I got to go to Sunday school, do something. And uh, we prayed for it during Sunday school. And the Lord even watches out over silly little things like sound systems and all those kinds of little details that in the big picture, the big scheme of things, don't matter a whole lot, probably. But he cares for us that much. And that is a very personal uh, testimony. And sometimes, um, sometimes we say things like, well, you know, God's not interested in those kind of individual, minuscule, tiny little details of life. But they just haven't read the Bible. <laughs> and that's why when you come to Psalm 27, this is a very personal psalm. Psalm 27 is our text today. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14. And I'll be honest with you, this psalm, this psalm is a problem for me. Especially because of what he tells us to do in verse 14. Which is a command. And it's an intensified command. It's not just wait on the Lord. It is wait on the Lord. It's in a, a stem that intensifies the verb. And he says that as we wait on the Lord, that's where we'll find our courage. And that's where we'll find the strength of the Lord. In fact, by the end of this psalm, the writer is resolved. I am going to wait on the Lord, and I'm commanding and calling you to wait on him with me. But that hasn't been my experience when I read a text like this, and when I read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord. That passage? That hasn't always been my Christian experience. I, I find myself exhausted and stretched and spent. Ironically, this word wait in the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew actually means to twist and to stretch. <laughs> Interesting, huh? The weight of anxiety sometimes burdens me. And in face, of the all, in face of everything that's in front of me, I lack the strength and courage to move forward sometimes. Like I said, when I read a, a text like this, it's a problem for me. So the simple and unvarnished truth that you need to understand is I don't like waiting and I don't know how to do it very well. So I need to preach this, and if I need to preach it, that means you need to hear it, and we all need to learn it together. Psalm 27, the Psalm of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? What's the answer? No one, absolutely no one. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? What's the answer? No one, nobody, not one person. When the wicked come against me, when the wicked came against me, he's looking into his past, to eat up my flesh. That sounds kind of serious, doesn't it? My enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, and this picture is being encircled by an enemy that is close at hand, my heart shall not fear. The wars rise against me in this, or that is, in this kind of situation, I'm going to be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now that may sound similar to Psalm 23. Where, where the psalmist David is looking into his future, where he's going to live in the spiritual house of the Lord forever, that is not what he's talking about here. He is talking about being in the presence of God at the tabernacle, worshiping the Lord, and just being at the tabernacle with the people of God, worshiping the Lord. That's what he was after. I want to be there. I want to be in the house of the Lord, he says, all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. Look at that, it's all caps again and again. Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of Israel. And to inquire in his temple. I want to behold his beauty and I want to ask questions. I want to learn, I want to be stretched, I want to seek. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. Another reference to worship at the temple or the tabernacle in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me he shall set me high upon a rock and my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle I will sing yes I will sing praises to the Lord 
Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Wow. What a turn, huh? When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path. Why? Because of my enemies. Because of what's going on in my life. These enemies that have, he says they have false witnesses. He says they don't deliver me over the will of my adversaries. That is, my adversaries have a plan for my life, but Lord, don't deliver me to that will. False witnesses have risen against me, such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart or just given up unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. Where? In heaven? No, no, no. Right here, right now, in the middle of what he was facing, I have believed and I'm convinced I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we pause our lives to sit at your feet and at the feet of your son Jesus with your book open in front of us, I pray, Father, that you would give us a vision of just how good and holy and right and loving and gracious and perfect that you are. Help us to behold your beauty as your word is preached and explained. Magnify yourself among your people and take our eyes off our trouble. And help us to put our eyes on you in Jesus' name. Everyone said. First of all, we need a definition of what biblical waiting is. Now, when you think of waiting, it's a negative thing. But in the biblical text of the Old Testament and in the New Testament, and we won't deal with the New Testament today, you need a quick definition. And if you take all of the passages in the Old Testament that talk about waiting, there's a couple of things you need to understand. First of all, waiting is not passive. You're not just standing in line waiting, waiting, doing nothing. No, it's active. It is an active attitude of the heart that you have to choose. You have to choose to wait the right way. It's not hopeless. That is, as we're waiting, we're not hopeless about the situation. It's an expectant attitude of God's promises being fulfilled in our lives and of God's goodness poured out on us in our lives. It's also not faithless. Waiting on the Lord reaches out in faith to the character of God and to the plan of God, the sovereignty and wisdom of God. Waiting is really a combination of three virtues that you find in the Bible. Faith, hope, you don't think this is a virtue, but it is, and patience. When you put faith and hope and you tie it together with patience, that's what it means to wait on the Lord. It rests upon the character of God, the promises of God, and the incomparable power of God. And when we learn to do it, When we really learn to wait in the biblical sense, it will result in an overflowing spiritual strength being given to us. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Well, the context of this psalm is very helpful. This is, of course, a psalm of David, as it it said, and the psalmist is under attack. And these are very real threats, so David is not... Um, uh, imagining foes. And you, you, could, you could talk about all sorts of the foes and the adversaries of his light. I, I just read a few, uh, early this week about Doeg. How many of y'all know who Doeg is? The Edomite. Yeah, he's the guy who, who, who told Saul where David was and then Saul comes and murders the priests of the Lord because David had visited the priests of the Lord while David was on the run. He could be imagining Doeg. He could also be imagining a very real threat from Saul as, as David for years was on the run After he was anointed king, he's on the run from his enemy. And his enemy was Saul, the king of Israel. Uh, He could also be imagining the evil that rose up in his own house because of his own sinfulness and his lack of good parenting and not being a good father and not protecting his own family. And you remember Absalom was raised up as an instrument of discipline in the life of David. And David had to evacuate the city and was almost killed by his own son, 
So this is the context. Uh, just listen to some of the words in this psalm. David is, is, is facing the wicked, his enemies, his foes. There are armies encompassed about him. There's a war that has risen up and is attacking him. This is a time of trouble, a time of adversaries, a time of liars and false witnesses who intend violence on him. So this isn't made up. This isn't uh, him thinking uh, too seriously about himself. In fact, whenever they arranged this psalm, they put it together with Psalm 26 and Psalm 28. And you can read all three of these together because they're very similar in theme and nature. Sometimes when you're reading the psalms, you'll see that some of the groupings, and this is one of the groupings in the first book of the psalms, Psalm 26, 27, and 28. As you look at this psalm, just in a quick overview of how it's laid out, verses 1 through 6 is separate from verses 7 through 14, or 7 through 12. In fact, one of the things I did this week is I took verses 1 through 6 and put it over here on a piece of paper, and then I took verses 7 through 12 and put it over here so that I could see them side by side because they are very different. And in verses 1 through 6, he is talking about the Lord. And he's looking at his past, and he's also looking into the future and what he expects the Lord to do. It's, 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 it's hopeful, it's full of faith. Verses 7 through 12... It's dark, it's hard, and it's difficult. In fact, it's caused some commentators to believe that these are two different psalms and they just pushed them together, and and I don't think that's really the intention here. And I'll explain that later. Some Some struggle to see how these two sections could be in the same psalm. Let me tell you why that is and why the psalms and the wisdom literature of the Old Testament is so important. The reason these two sections that are so different in tone and nature are in the same psalm is because those voices and those those experiences are in you. And sometimes, even in the same day, you will go from being verses 1 through 6 and what the Lord, what the Lord's done, what the Lord's going to do, to where you are crying out, God, answer me. And sometimes that's within the same day. So this, the Bible is, is, is giving us an unvarnished, just a very clear picture of what it's like to try to wait on the Lord. Sometimes it's difficult. So the psalmist, as you look at this passage, he, he actually ends where he begins. He begins with this, this incredible statement. And if you've been sick and you've been in the hospital, I may have read this to you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And put that side by side with verse 14, which is his command at the end of this psalm. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So the psalmist ends where he begins, and this is really where we're going to go throughout our our walk through this psalm, is that we find our strength when we wait on the Lord. When we learn to wait on the Lord... We will find our strength. First of all, he learned to wait on the Lord in verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3 deal with his past experiences. This is what life and what the Lord has taught him. This is what David has already experienced. You can think about his experience with Goliath. You can think about his experience alone on the hillside as he was a shepherd and he was protecting the sheep from adversaries and foes. I mean, foes that really did want to rend him in two. And he watched God deliver him and his sheepfold out of the jaws of an enemy. So this, this is something, uh, so he is, he is thinking back to all of these things that the Lord has done. And so who is the Lord in verses 1 and 2? The Lord is my light and my salvation. That's synonymous. He's not making a distinction there. He's describing it more fully. Our foes and our situation brings darkness and Sometimes even death, but the Lord is my light and my salvation. He is the strength of my life. And what did David learn through all of those past experiences? I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to be afraid of anyone. (laughs) Now isn't that one of the greatest gifts God could give us? That we could live the rest of our days not being afraid of our foes and our enemies, but rather fearing and trusting, the only one worthy of fear and trust, which is, of course, the Lord himself. Now, this wasn't hypothetical. These were real experiences of darkness and death and violence, and it wasn't exaggerated. When you look at verses 1 through 3, he starts on the individual level. I don't have to fear anyone singularly. But then sometimes there's enemies, plural, 
and there are foes and adversaries. And then those foes and adversaries get organized. Do you know that happens too? Those liars, those people that hate the Lord and maybe hate you, they don't just do it on their own. Sometimes they get together in a group and then they encircle you like an army. And then there's a war. I mean, it's gone from an individual all the way to an army and a war. Now listen to what, what David says as he reflects and how he learned to wait on the Lord. Verse 3 says, The war rise against me in this, that is in that circumstance, I will be confident. Now I want you to listen to what he says right there and make sure you don't misunderstand. He doesn't say, I'm going to be confident because I am David I'm the king, I'm really good with a sling, I'm wise, I'm powerful, I'm young. No, 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 listen to me, and I especially think about our, our teenagers that have just graduated from high school, and, and some, of the, some of the silliest things said from a, maybe a lecturer in front of a, a graduating class is telling you, believe in yourself, trust yourself, believe in yourself, you are the change maker, and we have these puffed, exaggerated uh, ideas about what it means to be a human being. Listen to me, our confidence doesn't come from who we are. It comes from whose we are and who we are in him. I can live confidently and fearlessly, just like David did. I can learn to wait on the Lord. So waiting on the Lord is an acquired skill that David learned in the reality of adversity. He also loved to wait on the Lord. Look at verses 4 through 6. This, this section describes his present expectation. So as David is thinking about what's coming up and what's going to come up in the future, this is, this is what David expected to see the Lord do in his life. And he, and he, and he describes it in terms of worship. And, and it pictures this, that David's already decided, when trouble comes, I'm going to worship my way through it. He's already decided, before trouble comes, I'm going to trust the Lord, I'm going to seek the Lord, I'm going to pray, I'm going to worship, I'm going to keep showing up to the, temp, to the tabernacle, I'm going to keep offering my sacrifices, I'm going to keep singing, I'm going to keep praising, I'm going to worship the Lord through my trouble. Why is it that when trouble comes, the people of God abandon the worship of God and the people of God? I do not understand that. That is the time in your life when you ought to be running to the Lord. You ought to be running to be in his presence. David loved to wait on the Lord. Look at what he describes in verses 4 through 6. He loved the place of worship. Now, you need to understand, as far as David is concerned, that the tabernacle was still just a tent. This isn't the Solomon's temple with all the gold, all of the fine, expensive. No, this is just a tent. So this isn't about some beautiful edifice, some big building. No, no, it's just a tent. But in that tent, this, this unremarkable tent, there was the symbolic presence of Yahweh. And when the Israelites came to worship, they were coming. Not just, because you need to understand, this wasn't just symbolic. <laughs> the Lord was there. And it didn't matter if it was a tent just a tabernacle. In fact, David empties his, the language, the Hebrew language. He calls it the house of the Lord, his temple, his pavilion, his tabernacle. He empties the Hebrew language describing how much he loved being there. That's the heart of a worshiper. Now some of you don't like church. Some of you have listened to all of the bad press about what the church is or what the church has done or hasn't done. And, and you may think, you know, I, I'm just not very impressed with the church. Look, we're not impressive. That's the point. We're, we're just vessels of clay. So what, what, you mean this building? No, we're not talking about the building. This building is not the church, folks. You are. And the reason why David, I mean, David wanted to be there with the people of God. He loved being there. And here's why. Because he also loved the person of worship. Look at what he says. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell. I just want to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I just want church to be every day of the week. I don't want to go anywhere else. 
And he says, why? To behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire at his temple. You see, David wasn't worshiping a place. He, was wor- he, was, he loved that place because of the person who made himself known there. He loved to go to the temple and watch the sacrifices because what it revealed about sin and holiness and salvation and redemption. He loved to hear the priests sing the words of God. He loved to hear teaching. He he loved all of that because it shows the person that he was worshiping. Sometimes people worship their worship. We worship our worship experience. It was a good church service day. Oh, man, you should have seen that. They brought the smoke in at the right time, and there were lights, and then the drums came in, and then the electric guitar. Or they had a doghouse bass this week, and, man, he was really thumping. It was real worship. They hit a high note. They hit a low note. The preacher, oh, man, he got red-faced and yelled at us. Man, he was, he was getting it today. Woo! That's not worship. That's worshiping worship. We don't come here to worship people. We come here to behold the beauty of the Lord and to forget everyone else. And ask the Lord, Lord, who are you? Who am I? Teach me. Show me. I want to know you. I want to see your glory. I want to see your beauty and your power. At the heart of David's worship was his love for the Lord himself. And David also loved the promises of worship. Look at what he says in verses 5 and 6. This is what he expected to see happen in his life, in the future when d- enemies would come. David expected since he was worshiping the Lord and, and seeking him that in my time of trouble, he, what's he going to do? He's going to hide me in his pavilion. So as David worship, worships, the Lord's going to hide him in that worship from his enemies. David says, I expect to just worship my way through my troubles. He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He's going to set me high upon a rock. Now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. What does that mean? Now my head shall be lifted up above all my enemies all around me. What is David expecting the Lord to do? What is David expecting the Lord to give him? Victory. As he's worshiping his way through his troubles, David expects him to be exalted above all of his enemies and them to be debased. And then he says, therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy. That is, I'm going to keep on doing all of the sacrificial system, and I'm going to do it with joyful shouts. I'm going to praise. I'm going to worship. He fully expected to be on the other side of his trouble with shouts of joy, shouts of victory, singing praises to the Lord. The more we worship and behold the beauty of the Lord, the less our trouble will trouble us. David learned to love to wait on the Lord. But David also struggled to wait on the Lord. And this is why verses 7 through 12 is in here. This is what David expected to see happen in verses 4 through 6. But this is what it felt like as it was happening in verses 7 through 12. You with me? So David... Loved to wait on the Lord, but he also struggled to wait. And when you come to verse 7, the tone of the, of the psalm changes. You remember, in the first six verses, David is talking about the Lord. Now he's talking to the Lord. And all of these, all the way through, verses 7 through 12, these are all commands. So this is a worshiper, as humbly as they can, commanding and asking the Lord to do what he said he would do. This is bold. It's awful, also difficult. He struggled to wait on the Lord. He struggled to wait in his praying. Verse 7 says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Now, wait a minute. Didn't you just say, I'm going to seek the Lord, and I'm going to see Him, I'm going to experience Him fully, and now He's saying, Lord, listen to me. But wait, I thought you said the Lord was your light and your salvation. Now it sounds like you're in the dark, and you're not even sure if the Lord's listening to you. It's a struggle to wait on the Lord. Verses 1 through 3 are still true. And David's experience in verse 7 is also true. Was the Lord listening? Yep. Did David sense that? He was having trouble with that, wasn't he? 
Have mercy upon me and answer me. Maybe, maybe David thought I've sinned and, and, and there's some sin between me and God that I don't know about, but God, have mercy on me. That's humble, right? But answer me. You ever say that to the Lord in prayer? God, I keep coming to you, I keep praying, and you're not answering. Maybe the answer is wait. 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 <laughs> he struggled in his worshiping. Verse 8, I'm seeking. You know, he just said, <laughs> look over there in verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that, I will, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. And it, and it pictures him coming and seeing the beauty and the glory of God. But then as David is doing that, in, in the context of what he was dealing with, he was having trouble waiting in his worshiping. Verse 8 says, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. But verse 9, do not hide your what? Don't hide your face from me. You ever feel that way? Probably. If you're honest about how you experience waiting on the Lord, sometimes it feels as if he's turned his face from you. Now listen to me. This is very important so that you understand who the Lord is. We turned our faces from him. We choose sin. We choose disobedience. We choose to live our own lives under our own authority, with our own will. That's what we do. That's what sinners do. But God has not turned his face from us. His posture towards us is one of grace and mercy coming towards us. But sometimes, as we're waiting on the Lord, it feels like his eye is on the sparrow, but he ain't paying attention to me. Right? It's like, great, he's watching sparrows, but he's not paying attention to me. <laughs> I'm seeking, but I'm not finding, Lord. <laughs> He also struggled to wait in his believing. Look at verses nine. Look at these. Look at these personal statements. Do not hide your face from me in verse nine. Do not turn your servant away in anger. Now, could the Lord be angry with his people? Yes. Is the Lord sometimes displeased with us? Mm hmm. Yeah, we will, will we sense sometimes if, if, if our attitude or maybe our sinfulness is, has caused a breach in our fellowship with the Lord? Certainly we're going to feel that way. David is saying, but don't turn your servant away, and it pictures dismissing. He's not just talking about how our fellowship is sometimes broken from sin. He's saying, look, I'm your servant, you're my Lord, you're my king, don't send me out of your presence. I've come to you for a hearing. I've come to you to talk to you as my king and my Lord and my Savior. Don't turn me away. That's what he's praying for. Now, would the Lord ever do that? No. But David thought he might. That's what it felt like while he was waiting. But maybe the Lord's just had enough of me. And he's turning me away in anger, never to be heard of. Or heard from again. Look what he says. Do not leave me. Nor forsake me. Oh God. Of my salvation. The God who has saved me. The God who keeps on saving me. Do not leave me. Do not forsake me. Now, is that possible? What we know of Jesus. What we know of the cross. Is it possible that God would ever forsake his own people ultimately? No, but as David is trying to learn to wait on the Lord, he felt like God might. And so he voiced that and says, don't, don't turn me away, O God of my salvation. And then, and then there's just a little glimmer of faith in verse 10. Where David grabs a hold of a very difficult situation. When my, when my father and my mother forsake me. Ooh. When I have to love the Lord more than I love my family. And I have to offend them so that I can please him. When I follow him and it bothers them and they forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. He also struggled to wait, not only in his praying and his worshiping and believing, he, he struggled to wait in his walking because he's, you know, he's dealing with all these enemies, right? There's an army encompassing him. He's under threat of attack and he's got to make decisions. I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, wait on the Lord. But, you know, while you're waiting, sometimes you have to choose, right? 
You have to, you have to make choices. We, God's not going to make all of our choices for us. Waiting isn't passive, it's active. And, and David was, was, was flummoxed and bothered by all of these enemies, and he didn't know what to do, what choice to make. And so he says in verse 11, teach me what? Not, not give me an answer. That's not the prayer. Teach me your what? Way. Yahweh, you have a way of thinking, a way of acting, a way of interacting with others. There is a way that is yours and yours alone, and I want to know what it is. Because when this kind of stuff is happening in your life, here's what your default is. Your default and my default is to do it my way. If you're thinking about playing the song My Way by Frank Sinatra, you know, at your funeral, I can go ahead and tell you, after you're with Jesus, I will not allow that to be played if I'm preaching. It's a horrible song. It is. Look at the message. We've got a way. When enemies come, what's my way? Blow them up! They lie about me, I lie more. They hit me in the chin, I'm going to give them a knee. Right? We have a way. And in the middle of all of that, we've got to stop and say, Lord, I'm struggling because I want to do what I normally do. And I need you to teach me your way. (laughs) He also struggled to wait in his hoping. Look at verses 12 and 13. David was hoping for temporal deliverance from his current situation. And he says, do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. And, and, and at times, God did. David did have to vacate the throne and leave Jerusalem when Absalom attacked, didn't he? Even as David is dying and they're trying to transfer the, the kingship and the authority from David to Solomon, there was an upheaval and a rebellion. So there were times when so this isn't one of those, everything's going uh, <laughs> to work out, everything just works out, you know, because you're, you're a Christian, everything's going to be good, you're never going to, you know. No, sometimes you're going to make an F on that paper, because you need to fail. <laughs> there are going to be times when, when you're not going to fulfill your obligations, and your boss is going to hold you into account. We need to experience that. God's not going to swoop in and just save you from every consequence of every decision of your life. That isn't how this works. We never learn that way. So David is really asking, God, I know that this may not work out, but I'm I'm asking you not to deliver me into the hand of my enemies because I know what they want to do to me. And God was gracious to David again and again and again in the life of David. Even though it may have been for a short time, God eventually delivered him out of the hand and the will of his enemies, didn't he? Let's just stop for a minute. Let's talk a little Jesus. Jesus didn't pray that prayer, did he? Jesus willingly and powerfully allowed himself to be handed over to his enemies. To the people who had a will for him. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to exterminate his name and his life. And Jesus said, yes, I'm going to allow you to do that. He allowed himself to be arrested. He allowed Pilate to execute him. He allowed all of that to happen. He allowed his enemies to kill him so that our enemies don't have to kill us. What a great exchange. What a savior. David was hoping for temporal deliverance and and, and his enemies would eventually, and there's this trickle of hope in verse 13 where where literally uh, David says, "I, I believed that is, in the moment while I'm struggling to wait, I, I believed. And what, what did he believe? I believed, David says, I believe that I'm going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. He's not talking about in the future. That's a given. Of course we're going to see goodness of the Lord in, his, in eternity. He's talking about right now in this present circumstance, I'm going to see the goodness and the hand and the mercy of God in my life. And it gave him hope even if it was just a trickle. Now, I want, to tell, I, want to, I want to relieve you of a burden today. Sometimes in the crisis, waiting on the Lord can be a battle, a battle with our adversaries, a battle with the adversary, a battle with ourselves. 
And sometimes it is a struggle to try to do what this psalm is telling us to do. But listen to me. If you are struggling to wait on the Lord, that only means you're in the middle of it. You're in the arena trying to actually obey the Lord and follow the Lord. You're actually being tested and tempted to not wait on the Lord. You're where you should be. Don't let the fact that it's a struggle cause you to think that you're in the wrong place or doing the wrong thing. No, no. Struggling doesn't mean you're a sinner. Struggling means you're a human. And and you are a sinful, broken human who needs help from the Lord. Struggling doesn't make you... Yes, struggling means you're weak. That's what he said at the beginning. He didn't say, we're strong. He said, the Lord is the strength of my life. Right? So don't let the struggle condemn you. Become bold enough like David was and and, and bring God's word to him and say, Lord, fulfill your promises. Be bold enough to ask the Lord to fulfill his word. Humble enough to ask for mercy. Humble humble enough before the Lord to be taught by him in the middle of that. Faithful enough to ultimately know that even if my own parents forsake me, Yahweh won't. Even if a church, an entire church, turns its back on me, the Lord will not. Not. If I stand completely alone and my own wife says, Honey, you need to consider a different course. Now, she would never do that because she's wiser than I am. We we need to be those kind of people. And that's why we come after this struggle, it's it's resolved. That's what the psalmist does. He's learned to wait on the Lord. He's loving waiting on the Lord. He struggled to wait on the Lord, and now he is resolved in verse 14. This is the end of the journey, right back where we started. After all he's learned, even through the crisis, he resolved to wait on the Lord. And he says it poetically, wait on the Lord, and then there's like a couple of little statements, and then wait on the Lord again. And what he does is he intensifies the command. And this is a command. The psalmist is saying, based upon my past experiences, based upon the present crisis and even how difficult it was, I'm telling you, you need to wait on the Lord. Yes, I will say it myself and I will say it louder and more emphatically. Wait on the Lord. And you need to resolve to do that. This is not a whimper. This is not a give up. This is not a groan. This is a stake in the ground about who you're going to be, who you're going to follow, who you're going to worship, who you're going to trust. And when we determine to wait on the Lord, what God promises us is that he will give us courage. And he will give us strength. Say, so, well, are we going to win? Ultimately, but we may lose a battle spectacularly. That's not the promise. The promise is, as I wait on the Lord, courage and strength. We will find his strength as we learn, love, struggle, and resolve to wait on the Lord. Now this matters because we are all waiting The Old Testament believers that read this psalm and David as he wrote it, they were waiting for the Messiah to come. They were waiting for the Messiah to deliver. They were waiting for God's kingdom to come to earth, right? We're 3,000 years removed from the writing of this psalm. We're 2,000 years removed from Jesus coming, incarnated into the world, living for us, dying for us, resurrecting in victory over sin, hell, death, and the grave, and then ascending back to the Father with a promise to return. We are still, after 2,000 years post-Jesus, we are still waiting. In fact, in the New Testament, it's eagerly anticipating the coming of our Lord Jesus That's how Paul writes it. That's how Peter writes it. We are eagerly expecting, eagerly waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus. We live our entire lives as Christians between all of the promises of God being given and their ultimate fulfillment. We all are waiting. And that's why we need to learn how. Because if you and I do not learn how to wait like this, you will never become a mature, fully formed child of God. 
If we cannot listen to the Lord and receive the command to wait, that does not mean there's something wrong with God. That means there's something wrong with me. I need to learn how to wait on Him. And this isn't just for when your enemies come. Waiting is our posture for the entire Christian life. So let me give you six practical steps, your next steps. What do we do while we wait? And when you look at this, and you can go back and read this for yourself and answer the question, what what am I supposed to do while I wait? Let me give you six things right directly from this passage. You are to keep on believing the Lord. That's what it means to wait on the Lord. I'm going to believe Him. I'm going to trust His goodness. I'm going to trust His promises. I'm going to trust His word. I'm going to rely. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep on Worshiping the Lord, loving Him, seeking Him, beholding His beauty. God's answer to your crisis is to see the glory of God in a way that causes your crisis to look very small and insignificant in relation to Him. The reason all your enemies look so powerful is because you are not stopping to behold the beauty of our Lord. He also tells us we need to be praying to the Lord, speaking to Him, talking to Him, even even if it's a struggle and even if it's a, a command we give the Lord, Lord, answer me, hear me, honor your word. We are to be seeking the Lord. Uh, Corey Ten Boom's book is great, and she talks about the fact that no matter how deep the well and the darkness is, God's grace is even deeper. You can find the Lord in the deepest, darkest pit this world can throw you in. Because whether you're on a mountaintop or you're in the lowest hell, he is there with his people. His face does not turn away from us. We are to learn from the Lord. We can learn his way and abandon our way. And we can also learn to hope in the Lord. Listen to me, church. Social media, CNN, Fox News, all of, those, all of those things out there, some of the people in your work, some of the people in school, some of your own friends and family members are sucking the life out of you and causing you to be hopeless. You're listening to the wrong voices. We can face everything we're facing right now expectantly. We can hope in the Lord and know that we're going to see goodness right now. Even as, even as this, this, this country unravels, We will see the goodness of the Lord if we're looking for it. We're going to see it now, and we're going to see it forever. He's going to pour out his goodness and his mercy on us forever through his son Jesus into the eternal ages. Believing, worshiping, praying, seeking, learning, and hoping in the Lord. That is what it means to wait. This psalm also points us to our personal salvation this psalm, as you, as you read this psalm, and maybe you know, this is your first time to church in a while, or, or maybe as you read this psalm, you find it a little concerning that it's so personal. It's as if the psalmist knows the person he's writing about and the person he's talking to. That, that's the implication here, right? And that's exactly what's happening. David had been saved by Yahweh. Yahweh, the Lord, was his God. He knew the Lord, the God of his salvation. Waiting is a great posture to describe salvation. Now, why do I have to wait to be saved? Here's why. Because you cannot save yourself. You, if you want to be saved by the Lord, like, like David was, if you want to know him, if you want to be in his presence so that he, you can always see his face and be assured of that, you need to understand something. You, you just got to wait. And you got to, you got to resolve to just, Lord, you got to save me because I can't save myself. I'm dead in my sins. I'm blind. I'm helpless. And I'm waiting for someone to come along and deliver me. And that's exactly what the Lord longs to do in your life. You can't save yourself. You need to wait on the Lord to save you. Trust Him. Believe Him. Maybe you've come to this house of the Lord today to behold the beauty of the Lord. Or or maybe you didn't come to behold the beauty of the Lord. You wanted to see this kooky group of people called Center Fork Baptist and, and in the middle of all this you, you, you've heard words and songs about this Jesus and, and, and maybe you've got a memory of some of the things in the Bible about his miracles and his, and his teaching and 
And you heard me mention the fact that he allowed himself to be put on a tree for our sins. And maybe right now in this moment, you're wondering, who is this Jesus and why does he love me so much? Oh, please listen to me. May the word of God and the Holy Spirit make it clear to you. May it hit you like a ton of bricks right from this psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Is that your testimony this morning? Is he your light in darkness? Is he your salvation from sin, death, and hell? Because, oh, he wants to be. Jesus came to live and to die not just to save you from your mortal enemies and your earthly enemies, but from your spiritual enemies of sin and death and hell and Satan. Have you given up trying to fix yourself? Have you thrown yourself at his feet? Because the people that God saves are the people that throw themselves at his feet and wait on him. He'll pick us up. He'll save us. He'll bring us to himself. That's... The invitation from Isaiah 25, Sean's going to come. I want to read you this invitation. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior this morning, listen to this invitation to wait on the Lord and be saved. It's looking forward to the day where, where Jerusalem and Judea will be the center of, of human government in this coming kingdom and even in the eternal kingdom. And Isaiah says, In this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people, that is not just Jews but also Gentiles, a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wine on the lees. In other words, the Lord of hosts is going to throw a feast. And he's going to invite not only Jewish people but all of the Gentiles. Come to my kingdom, come to my table. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. Right now there is a veil of death and ignorance and blindness over this whole earth and over all the peoples. But one of these days, God is going to fix that. And then he says, And he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And then, this is what those who are gathered, those who have been saved by this great Lord of hosts, this is what we get to say to him. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Maybe today's your day to come to the table and to say this to the Lord. Lord, you are my light. You are my salvation. Save me and deliver me today. Why don't you stand with me as we have this time of invitation together. We tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me.
call. 